dear guests, friends, colleagues. It's very, very nice, and I'm so thrilled uh, that you all came today uh, to visit us. I have to close the music. My name is Tanya. I'm CEO here at Grand Tafte Gård. Grand Tafte Gård is since 2001. Uh, we were we are we are a trust, and we use um, all this agriculture what we have. Uh, we use that to help uh, disabled people to uh, gain trust in themselves and uh, make them thrive. Uh, so they uh, they really um, can see the point in fulfilling their dreams. Uh, to get to work or go further in education. So that is our, we, we uh, use those methods called social farming, uh, the principles what we are doing here at the farm. We have over 20 years experience in ideological um, um, uh, agriculture. And uh, in the last couple of years, we have been, um, uh, have we have this vision that we, uh, we have to go from ownership to access to. And in that process, uh, we have invited uh, very good people uh, inside to help us to fulfill the dreams about this uh, regenerative uh, agriculture and uh, the production of uh, food. And in, um, yeah, what is it, two years ago, Josipa? Last, last year, I think one and a half, spring. last spring, we, uh, uh, we saw each other and um, love at first sight like that, <laughs> I think. So uh, that was uh, the first journey. Um, yeah, and, uh, and I think we will have a long relationship. Yeah, yeah, to, <laughs> yeah we have to make something big here uh, with this forest. So, and of course, because of you, and you uh, have been studying with Ernst, and uh, therefore we are here today, all of us. So uh, would you please uh, give it up for the two? Yeah. <laughs> Hello everyone, welcome. Um, I'll just make a very brief presentation and then I'll turn it over um, to Ernst. So my name is Josipa and I would say I'm a very novice student of what Ernst is um, trying to teach and his methods. So um, I live in the city, I didn't have any land, so I got the opportunity here to come and um, try. Should I stand on this side? Um, <clears throat> so we started a very small um, experiment on a field here at Gran Toftico. It's about 800 um, square meters. And here we planted these um, special um, tree lines that um, are supposed to produce different um, fruit and nuts and inspired by the methods um, that Ernst teaches, where you really try to mimic kind of um, a succession of species so that you have, um, um, you support the trees that you want to have along the way so that they um, are strong and resilient and produce well. Um, so I've planted a couple, um, some lines last year which are growing, and then Ernst is here now, and we are trying to um, improve and change and learn more ways of doing it. So this week we've been uh, planting a few more rows, also focused on uh, fruit and nut trees and berries, and also uh, vegetable production in the start. So from this system, I harvested um, a lot of garlic, and salad and radishes and fennel, different veggies. Um, and the garlic, some of the garlic we're planting uh, again. And these are kind of the um, support species in the start while the forest is growing up. Um, and this is just a few pictures of the rows that we've planted and seed mixes of tree um, seeds we made and potatoes. So. This is a different uh, time of year to plant potatoes, so we'll see. I'll make a record next year. 
Um, I trust Anne's that it works. So, and this is kind of the the future vision of a five hectare field that we would like to um, um, implement some of after Anne's method. So we've also discussed um, ideas on this trip. <coughs> Um, and I just very briefly want to say um, why I'm so inspired by Ernst and excited by his way of looking at the world. So um, I think also for me, the planet is a living organism and it needs ecosystems to function. It's kind of like its, its organs. And um, when we humans, you can go to the next... Um, there's a certain natural processes that happen and how ecosystems come about, how they function and their dynamism. And humans often um, plant in a very different way. We simplify things. A lot of times we have monocultures that are very far away from these um, natural processes and systems. So I think this is... Um, this is why we have kind of the, the challenges we have that we call climate or biodiversity crisis. And I think um, it would um, be more exciting to get closer to how nature works and, and integrate ourselves into it. So if you go to the next. So this is another kind of um, thinking that I, I don't, I would like to think in a different way because we say humans do these kinds of things, these monocultures and um, mining the soil and um, things that make it then not possible for us to use the soil. And then we think of nature as something that only can be there if humans are kept out of it. And that's why I think I'm so excited or I like how Ernst thinks because he has shown us how humans need to be and can be an integrated part of an ecosystem and of nature, and we are actually nature. So I think we need to, it's, we should also act in this way and be beneficial to the land that we're working with. Um, so the next one. Um, so I want to um, just show briefly before Enz comes on, um, basically how this looks. So Ernst is not just a person who talks, he has really done it um, in Brazil where he lives and he's been many places also to, um, to help others implement the same thing. Um, so this is a short film of Ernst's house and his farm and how he farms. So I think if we look, think about farming, we wouldn't get this image but in Denmark, we're also a forest ecosystem, um, the original one. So my dream is that farms could also look like this, not with these species, but <laughs> as forest. So um, a little video, and then I'll give it over to Ernst.
Yeah, good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Ernst Goetsch. I am a farmer since more than 60 years. First in, in Europe, a time I, a certain time after studies, I dedicate myself to uh, plant improvements, that's to say, yeah, to plant improvement, uh, genetic, genetics, and that work brought me to the conclusion that it perhaps could be uh, more efficient and more intelligent to focus on the ecosystems or the conditions we offer to our, uh, to our uh, species instead of trying to adapt the plants on each step we uh, deplete our soil, destroy our ecosystem, that's to say, worsening the conditions we, we offer to them, uh, adapting them, we did first, we, this, uh, it's an old history, yeah, the main, since 12,000 years, since the beginning of this uh, uh, warm period, after the great icy period, when he occurred about 35 to 45,000 years ago, modern man, not our ancestors, but modern man, he occurred, uh, made for uh, living and be useful in that in that in that ecosystem. Opla, yeah, this uh, In that ecosystem, uh, which was steppy, all over the world. Even the place where I'm living at the moment, uh, in the tropics, in in, uh, in the eastern part of uh, the, uh, of Brazil. Bahia, which is just in the middle from the north to the south, 15 degrees south, and about 300 meters upon sea level, 60, 50 kilometers from the sea direct line, from the sea. From the sea. And uh, it's since about 12,000 years, it's a forest before, before during uh, the icy period, and more even 30, 40 to 20,000 years ago, it was a dune, a dune. That's to say, it was dry, no forest. And then forest came back. And this happened all over the world. Man, at the end of the last icy period, or let's say in, in uh, 20,000 years ago, uh, he lived in an environment where 80 Eight percent was uh, steppe or uh, open forests. Open forests, yeah, open savannas. And the few parts which were really forests, the tropics, they, they were nearly inhabited. And then, with the change of the climate some 12,000 years ago, men lost his habitat, and instead of, in my interpretation, instead of looking for or figuring out uh, a niche to be useful in a new ecosystem, he decided to remove the forest which came up, and he does it up to now. We see it all over the world. Nowadays, they blame Brazilians that they are cutting the forest, but European should be ashamed. They cut down more forests than any other civilization, any other people all over the world. We still see it all over the world. That the rest over still the Amazon in Brazil. This is true. Uh, by incidence, we came to conclusion that when Portuguese and Spaniards came to that place, they lived, we don't know exactly, but between 20 to 30 millions of people in the Amazon. And that forest, great part of it, it's still, it was still visible up to 
30, 40 years, 50 years ago, before the great uh, next uh, invasion by by uh, European people, that to say, by, by Brazilians in this case, and from the other side, Spaniards, to the Amazon. Because we see, it's clear, yeah, there are many, many species which have uh, co-evolution with men. And, for example, Brazil not, uh, manioc, uh, cassava. And then many, many, many fruit trees, they have uh, co-evolution with men. Uh, by incidence too, a quinoa, and which is from the highlands of uh, Bolivia, and that too has, has a co-evolution with men, together with the animals there. It's it's a uh, uh, llama, and then in a forest, a tropical forest, Brazil, as I, as I said, and cassava. Cassava is not from Amazon. It had been brought by men from the place where I'm living, a little bit more in the in, uh, inner side of the, of the continent, about 200 kilometers more west. It's a dry forest, and uh, from there, there is still the origin. If you fell a forest, about 150 to 200 different genotypes of many of uh, cassava come up. And if you cut nowadays in those places, as long as we don't use, uh, pl uh, don't plow and don't use glyphosate, still 30 to 50 uh, different genotypes come up, despite of the fact that it had been in the last uh, one or one and a half centuries. Uh, every time in shorter periods, felt, let's say, submitted to slash and burn, felt and then burned and planted. Cassava once again and once again. Okay, man, uh, an animal from a steppe, from a steppe, or let's say a species of a steppe, and he, as I said, he decided uh, to to remove forests, and we do it up to now, all over the world. And so I said to you, not for living in Brazil, what Brazilian does is uh, do is nothing different than what. We did and do still. We look at Europe, uh, Sweden, uh, then uh, the, the, the Baltic uh, countries, Poland and other places, removing forests. Russia, removing forests. France has not had no, not, not, not more, much uh, more forest to remove. And if you, you look at, at the Netherlands, how much? How many percent they have forest? Uh, forest, forest, zero. Yeah, I have some plantations. How much forest do you have here in in Denmark? Close to zero. Yeah, we have a lot of plantations too in Brazil. You know, there there were about. Uh, I don't know exactly, but may maybe uh, 18 million 18 millions hectare of, of uh, eucalyptus. It's a small piece only. <laughs> all like, all, the eucalypt, uh, all the eucalypt, uh, eucalyptus. Eucalyptus is, is the same thing as, as your forest. It's not, it's not different. That's to, say, it's, it's, uh, that's to say, it's the same thing. Then we have an Amazon forest. If Europeans and Chinese, but Europeans buy a lot, wouldn't buy soya beans to give to their cattle and to their pigs. Brazilian wouldn't cut, wouldn't fell the wood. And then they use, uh, that's the same first, uh, first place is, is uh, Monsanto and uh, Bayo, and Bayo is now Monsanto, but uh, Monsanto is Bayo. Uh, Europeans won again, yeah, once again. They uh, sell uh, the the the, <laughs> the medicine <laughs> the plantos let's just say the the poisons to uh, to to destroy the, those ecosystems uh, once first to, to to control invasive plants there are some any invasive plants on this planet there are any invasive plants on this planet? No. I, I believe not. Let's say I've never seen an invasive plant. I have seen invasive people. 
but not invasive plant. And I work now since more than 60 years as professional in agriculture. Uh, and I never have been stolen by plant. <laughs> never heard a lie uh, or something, other tricks by plants in order to trick me out. It's, they have, there is ethics and uh, relations between uh, different species and in uh, different species is based, I'm sure, and I act on that, uh, unilaterally on unconditional love and cooperation. No competition. Competition we see in our mirror. And we interpret this as competition. If I have so-called weeds invading, hmm, occupy my, my uh, agriculture used, or that to say my land, or my, yeah, my land, and it's not invasive. It's coming in order to improve soil conditions. We are coming now from a small place, a small, yeah, five hectares we looked at some uh, half an hour ago or one hour ago. And there are a lot of distils and dandelions and, and other plants indicating that the soil is seriously uh, compacted. And so that distils are not invasive. They, are, they came in order to perform or to realize their task to fulfill their function, to improve the soil. And if we would, I ought to say, go away of that place, I'm sure after a few years we would have uh, a new secondary forest. And after, same as in Chernobyl, after 15 years it would be a forest and it would be a strong forest than in any place where we are uh, making intervention. And at the same time, uh, Man gave to himself, it were Europeans, uh, proudly and arrogant in an arrogant way, the name of Homo sapiens sapiens. I don't only see anything of sapiens, I only see that he behaves as Homo destructor. Uh, ignorance. This, yes. Okay. Uh, let me see now, or let uh, you say now what I believe, no, what I'm doing, uh, doing agriculture. What I'm doing here in the tropics, uh, there in, in this picture in the tropics, Genevieve, uh, you could, you could uh, pass a small of those um, um, movies, or movies, yeah, film I made before I left. The farm. That one with the corn. That one with the corn. Uh, only to, in order to give an idea. Yeah. Uh, in fact, what I'm doing, I'm doing, doing it now in the tropics, but I'm working also in, in all different types of, of climates. Uh, for example, in the uh, end of last century, in the beginning of this century, I, worked, I did several works in. Uh, highlands of Bolivia on 5,000 meters upon sea level, 5,300 to 4,800 to 5,300 meters upon sea level is uh, in the surrounding of the Salaras of Uyuni. And there it's quite uh, cold. It can, uh, it can have frost every day of the year. But it's a place of uh, origin of quinoa. Uh, a very important cultivated plants of the Aymaras and Quechuas, people there, and it's a place for Yama. And uh, when I came there, uh, there was in two places where we passed, uh, locals uh, uh, told us uh, the same account, they gave us the same, uh, past the same account that uh, tiger, that black tiger, had attacked, panto, has attacked, it's, you have, in order to know what it is, it's, it's a, a, a predator, a cat, it can come to four meters length from tail to, to, to head, and 250 kilo, it's a big, a very big cat. 
it's very weak yet. And uh, so uh, uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, the tiger, as they, they called, they had attacked the Yama. And then they, you have to, you, to know that in that place, it's highland, and it's covered, uh, the place, or it's covered, it's, it's cut with hundreds of kilometers of walls, or of, of rows, of uh, rows, of, of walls, yeah, of, of, of stones, more or less this height, and about two meters width. It's clear it's, it's not the fence. It's something like uh, a guide for the animals. And in the upper parts, the, the, the pieces or the, the cells are bigger. They might come to 100 hectares or more. And in the lower parts, they are smaller, two, three hectares or half a hectare. And so they said to me that they remembered, or let's say the, elder, the older ones uh, had said to them, or uh, yeah, said to them that, told to them that in former time, uh, they, uh, before the Spaniards came, they had the, uh, the, the, the llamas in springtime, October, November, in the lower parts. And then the cat didn't attack it. Let's just say the tiger didn't attack it. Oh, it makes sense. For me, for me, it makes it made sense. Sense they they didn't know no, didn't uh, were not uh, they had no no uh, answer for that uh, fact. But for me, it made sense. It's for me clear. It's a coevolution between the predator, the uh, yama, predator for yama, the yama, man, and quinoa and potatoes. Potatoes are from that place, uh, not the potatoes. Yeah, you know, potatoes. The ancestors of the potatoes we eat are from that place. Small, well, very good, very good, nutty flavor and uh, extremely good, and so. Uh, they brought those animals to the, to to one of those places, as I say, the uh, of one of those, those cells, and I asked to give me perm permit to or to bring me to that place, and so I saw that the uh, llama, they browsed all the bush trees, all the the secondary forest trees. There in that place, they don't grow more than one to to three meters. Height maximum three meters, not three meters, two and a half meter, half a meter to two and a half meter, and uh, in between there is the pampa grass. Sometimes you, we see it in Europe to plant it. It's pampa grass. Uh, other animal do, doesn't eat it, but it seems that llama eat it. They browse it, and so they brought me to the place, and it was all pruned, and uh, llama it deposits its feces in heaps of about of about 50 to 100 liter. They are both like this, similar to that of goats, only of goats are small, and uh, sheep are smaller even. Uh, but they are dry and they deposit it. In any case, it's very dry there. It's, it's, uh, they have about 80 to 150 millimeters of precipitation, but this corresponds to this climate here, to more or less 600 millimeters of precipitation. You have to consider altitude, latitude. Five and a half thousand, uh, five thousand meters upon sea level is quite, quite cool, uh, quite cold. Okay, and so I said to him, I could come, I could return, uh, yeah, could we perhaps plant next year some uh, quinoa here? It's prepared for quinoa because at since the Spaniard uh, came to the to that place, they mm, taught people that it's not intelligent. What they do, that they should you, uh, use an axe, you should use, use a knife, in order, an axe in order, and a hoe, in order to get rid of those grass, and, and an axe in order to get rid of the trees, and then plant uh, quinoa. Quinoa is a plant which, uh, quinoa real is a plant which grows about two and a half meters tall, and uh, on that places, they harvest from 
one uh, from three plants. Uh, they plant together. It's seeds, perhaps you know, it's more or less of a size of, of uh, uh, let me see, uh, sesamo, of sesamo, uh, of, of uh, radish seeds, as you know, uh, you know better. Of radish seeds, more or less of, of that size, a little bit little, a smaller, yeah, but right, radish seeds, yeah, it's all okay. Uh, and it gives three, ki uh, three kilo, th that each plant, uh, one kilo. And nowadays, mechanized in a mechanized way, they harvest 1,000 to 1,500 kilo per hectare, which is very, very few. And so we, they said, yeah, we plant it in, in uh, next September, that's to say after, uh, the, in fall of winter time, beginning of springtime, before the, spring, the vegetation begins to grow, make a small hole, uh, and then small three centimeters, put three seeds in it and uh, three or one uh, piece of feces of this, uh, both of feces of, uh, of the um, uh, yama. And so I went there next September, and it was, in fact, it was just in the beginning of September, and we planted it. And then in May, I returned. We harvested 13,000 kilo of quinoa per hectare. We planted it one meter 20 from one to another, and more or less three kilo for each plant, sometimes a uh, little bit less. And potato, just in the cross point of, of the crossing of the uh, diagonals between the four uh, quinoa planted in in in, uh, in square. Yeah, and the same amount or the same weight uh, yeah, amount of of potatoes, small potatoes, but very very good ones. Agriculture in a different way, and it was interesting during the next summer, the 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 the, 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 the um, uh, the bush trees for that forest, and the and the uh, the grass, the pampa grass, grew again. They're beautiful. So next autumn, they can return or could return to do the same. Agriculture producing much more than we are producing. Uh, when you have animals to do this job, it's it's marvelous. Uh, nowadays, uh, our uh, yama could be cattle, or oh, cattle, <laughs> uh, but uh, we could think about these two. But cattle is not um, has, is not big enough, or, or, uh, yeah, big enough in order to to prune our trees. And so we have to do it in a different way. Uh, I'm working. With uh, together with my son, two in Switzerland, and they're working in other uh, in other places. And before I went to the tropics, I planted first. Let's say when I stopped or decided to stop uh, working in, in plant improvement, I tested first crop rotation. Crop rotation uh, we had complex. Uh, types of crop rotation. One of the, let's just say, if you're on this site, some ones, which my father still did. It, when it was a clay, more uh, heavier soil, more clay, it was a six year rotation, three years clover grass, and then three years open land, first year turnip, and second year wheat, third year, uh, second year wheat, and after wheat still um, well, happened often. He had two options. One was after wheat, he harvested as all people, all for yeah, all all people all over the world. That is in all planets. They did it up to the fifties, all over the world, harvesting also here in Denmark. They harvested the their cereals when physiological physiologically ripe. This would be uh, looking at, at uh, wheat at the point when the grains don't have more water in it. That's to say when you squeeze it, that's, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's 
it, it's no more water in it. But water, it's, it gives no more milk. But it's still soft. And if you chew it, you have afterwards a uh, chewing gum in your uh, mouth. And it's in, at the point when the weed, when it flowers, it's like this, isn't it? And then it begins, it begins to ripe, and the more it progresses, when it is more or less this, then it's physiologically ripe, and then it's like this. Then it's morphologically ripe. And if you look at the interaction of that uh, cereals to the place, uh, in the beginning it grows slowly, and then it creates, little by little, step by step, it's uh, using, the, by the use of its mycorrhizin, the conditions to grow fast. It comes in a phase of fast growing, very fast growing. Here it might be between mid-April and mid or end May when it flowers. It might be here a little bit more north than Switzerland. It might be end of May, beginning June. It flowers and there is the peak of uh, activities. And then when it's coming to, to uh, physiologically ripe, it's more or less 30, 38, 40, 40, 45% still of it, what it did, oh, it had capacity, 40%. But it had of, of uh, capacity when it was in the phase of fast, uh, of vigorous growth. And if you cut it at that time, you have a better quality grains. It has more uh, vitamins, it has a better uh, taste, it, it's better bread, uh, more uh, uh, ferments and more enzymes than when it's morphologically ripe, then it is not dead, but nearly dead. Uh, the bread is no more uh, as good as it was. Perhaps uh, here are some old people who remember still that they harvested and then put it in bundles uh, in a field and the cover with the same, with another bundle, just a pond. And uh, the, the grains, in this case, were, had a, something like a golden color. Uh, that's to say, it was not uh, pale brown or gray, it was, had a golden color. And the grain was bigger. Okay, nowadays we have, uh, that's to say, in the 50s, Americans brought us the, the harvester. And the harvester is not equipped to, to harvest the corn in that way. And so we come to morphologically ripe, then you have no more left over of, those, uh, of the, uh, the work of the microism of, of our plants. And the next uh, generation of plants, they have to create, once again, their uh, conditions, let's say, yeah, and, and raise them. And this costs a lot, and so we have to give fertilizer. That's, but this is a big business for some people, uh, and so they recommend that we have to do it. And at the same time, if you harvest it when morphologically ripe, the soil is uh, compacts much more because it's, it dies a little bit. Let's say it's a dying process. And so uh, <clears throat> in former time, that's as my father did it too, uh, harvest it corn. Uh, let's say wheat, um, not the corn, but wheat and and uh, uh, rye and and uh, spelt, beginning mid July, and in the, at the same day, he planted the next crop. It was normally uh, oats and visia sativa. Hmm, visia sativa. What's the name of visia sativa in in, in English? Vetch. You're right. Uh, oats and veg, and sometimes some other stuff still. And then that he cut mid-October to end October, and giving that to the cattle, he had to give, to give them fibers in order to uh, avoid that they uh, get diary, diary, uh, 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 diarrhea, and uh, they, they gave a lot of milk doing that, so he, he needed no... Uh, no soya beans to to get to, yeah to get a lot of milk from his cows. Another possibility or another option he did too, in February, March, beginning March, uh, when the 
yeah, the wind, the wind not, was not just on, uh, at the end, but then it began to, to, to get green a little bit. He broadcast, uh, broadcasted um, Alex, uh, Trifolium Alexandr Alexandrinum or Trifolium Persicum, let's say, yeah, uh, Persian or Alexandrinum clover. And uh, um, Lolium Italicum, no, not Lolium Italicum, Lolium Westerwaldicum. This is Westerwaldish ryegrass. It's, it seems it has the same name uh, in English uh, because it's, it's a nice, it comes from a scientific name. Broadcast that upon and then uh, rake upon in order to and, uh, in order to fix a little bit the seeds and so it began in June uh, beginning in July uh, that grass and the clover was more or less this height and we used long straw or he used or it has been used long straw uh, cereals and he always planted uh, at least three types of cereals together. Even if it was from the same species, about 60%, 65% of a medium high or a lower, uh, the lower at that time was his height of, of uh, wheat, and the higher one of 190 more or less, and then another one of 2, 2 meter 10, 2 meter 20, 5% uh, only that one. And this has a, had the effect that when the wind uh, blew, uh, the grass fixed it a little bit. And then the, the medium one, uh, the, the lower one, uh, also fixed, it helped the, the, the higher one, and the higher one bent, and then the next one bent, and the next one uh, bent a little bit, but it didn't fall down. And the straw was all beneficial for the place. And the lower part he needed for, he used for, for fibers in, in autumn time, because in the same uh, crop rotation, in the first time, uh, in more sandy places, which he had two, he planted in springtime potatoes, covered it with uh, straw and and uh, thick layer, a thick layer of straw, bed of the cattle, but a lot, a lot of straw in it, and so it needs. It was not had not been planted into the soil, but upon the soil, and no no need for pesticides, no need for insecticides, nothing at all, and easy to harvest because. The plant, when it ripens, you can get it out, and all the potatoes are just uh, hang on the roads still. And so, uh, it was one of his um, of his income, a uh, substantial part of his income, planting potatoes in those sandy parts. One, as I said, first year, and in sandy sandy parts. Okay, crop rotation, and then in, returning now to the last year of the rot crop rotation. Uh, he planted different things. Sometimes it was um, after wheat, which he uh, did too. He planted uh, once again uh, oats, a little bit uh, vegetable uh, uh, ryegrass, a little bit clover, and wedge. And together, about 20 kilo of uh, spelt per hectare and 10 kilo of, 7 kilo of a long one, a medium long one, and then about 3 or 4 kilo of a very long uh, rye together. That uh, block, or that, that vegetation planted just after harvest of the wheat, when it was physiologically ripe in, in uh, the beginning of July, uh, until uh, mid-October, uh, end October, it was that uh, 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 oats began to flower, and so it was at the point to give to cattle, and it was the same thing, he had to give fibers uh, to that. And after, in the sandy places where he planted potatoes, once uh, uh, every four years, he planted just after early potatoes, he had potatoes, you can still buy it in Switzerland uh, from an organization, it's called Pro especies rara, uh, potatoes which uh, you can harvest after two months. That is a two month uh, potato. It's very tasty and it's produced a lot. And he planted them uh, end of March, beginning April, in that in a lot of straw, as I said to you, this, this much of straw, 
uh, together with a little bit uh, that is cow dung. He gave it to the cow and the cows and then uh, bring it out together with the feces of uh, the cows. And so it, it, no problem with frost because when you have frost, it's you have you had sun the day before, uh, yeah, and so the sun heats up a little bit. That's true, and so you have no frost upon. And then if you would have frost. It's only the, the upper leaves which can suffer a little bit because they hide them themselves a little bit in a straw. And then end of May, it was at the point to be harvested, beginning June. Then we planted, we planted corn. And a corn, uh, also uh, oats, and a uh, little bit wedge, and peas, pies, and pies, a piece. Uh, this he harvested at mid-September to mid-October. Also he had to give uh, fibers in order to avoid that the cattle had, uh, became diary from that fodder. So he had always two hours. Sometimes he always after, uh, also after wheat he planted uh, yellow turnip to be harvested in uh, October, end of October too, given to the to the cattle. Once again, it was necessary to give fibers in order to equilibrate the the fodder from them. And so he had a lot, he had an excellent fodder. Uh, in winter time, until January, February, he, he had a lot of apple and pear trees, and he made the juice uh, on the farm. And so he gave the uh, the, the rest, the trepo, to the uh, to the cattle which was uh, together with turnip uh, in order to, to increase the appetite of the animals. And so we had a, a considerable a high uh, milk production. And additionally, cattle, cow, at that time, it lived 25 years, 30 years, giving every year a, a, a calf without medicine, without... Uh, a doctor without anything, only receiving a good father. Uh, your food be your medicine, also for cattle. I know that he didn't get 12,000 liter milk or 15 or 20 per cow. It was in fact about four and a half thousand liter. But when the cow lives 25 years and gives his 23 calves, it's very cheap. And if you need no concentrate, no, let's say no extra fallow, uh, only hay, grass, and uh, what you produce on the farm, uh, it perhaps would be a little bit more profitable than what we do nowadays, because uh, nowadays a, c a cow giving uh, 20,000 liters, normally it, it doesn't support uh, to give to do that more than two or three years, that's to say latest four or five years, it's the end of its life. And then I wouldn't like to be cow to do that. Because, and also the milk is not good, and it doesn't, it, it's not good for our, for our health. And so we could think about. Yeah, once again, this is now, could now be agriculture. Uh, in Central Europe, I have to say that the photos we still have from the landscape in Switzerland, probably you have it too from Denmark, uh, from the 20s or from the beginning of the last century. In fact, in, in my case, we have uh, the photos of the whole, nearly of the whole country, and the place I, I, uh, have, uh, I born, it was completely different in the beginning of the last century. Uh, at that time, they still had every 15 to, to 25 meters a hedge, and the hedge pruned every year, and then in the middle of the stripes, between the hedges, they had a row of fruit trees. 
uh, apple trees, pear trees, plums, uh, whatever you want. And in between, st uh, some uh, every 10 meters, 15 meters, between the trees, uh, a poplar tree. And then underneath a row, just in a line of the fruit trees, a row of berries. Uh, red current, black current, uh, gooseberries, and the, the material of the, let's say, the pruning, the material of pruning, or the, the, the branches, branches of the pruning of the fruit trees, uh, they had been organized in a stripe, both sides, in a bed, both sides, underneath the trees and the, the berries. So it was easy to to the merchant. Uh, that's a senior manage. No problem with uh, with uh, even a small machine we had to cut the grass or to harvest the, the cereals. And then there was a, an art. That's to say, they had uh, they looked for the composition of plants. Uh, that's to say, a lot of focus on late. Um, how it's called flowering uh, apple and pear trees in order to give the cereals underneath to be planted, uh, let's say in between, to be planted and give them the winter cereals, not summer cereals, to give the possibility to flower uh, before the full uh, set of leaves of the trees. And in any case, they fly, they, 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 they've grow much more before it's winter cereals, they grow much more before the trees have their leaves. And so, no problems. And afterwards, uh, harvest was normally quite a lot underneath the trees. And so, uh, and even more the old varieties. Uh, we still have some of those old varieties, not many, not many, but we still have. And they are more uh, shade. Uh, resistant and, and uh, yeah, better adapted for the climate than the new ones. And the new ones, in any case, I wouldn't plant them because they do not do, they are not able to do what people believe that they are doing. This is regenerate, regenerative agriculture. I don't live in Europe, but I listen sometimes and see sometimes what they are doing in the saying, saying they, if you have some crop rotation, some animals in between, it's so called, mm -hmm, uh, how it's called, um, their uh, cattle operation, uh, yeah, all sustainable. I don't know. I never have seen a grass or a herb to build up significantly soil. It could, it can, it is able to give a slight brown or red, uh, brown or, or black uh, color to the soil, but it lacks something completely, which is fungi. Or nearly completely. And overall fungi, which give the health uh, indirectly, the health to to uh, our cereals, to our to our uh, vegetables, to the plants we use, and also yeah, and so this lacks nearly completely. Uh, additionally, all these those plants, all cereals. Yeah, uh, it's it's good. It's I, I suppose it is it is one of these. Yes, shall I show? You let me know when. when yeah, yeah, and then we we could we could afterwards. Uh, was, I will come to the point that I'm planting, yes, uh, no, no. that I'm planting together with tree. But now I'm mo more extreme. Even uh, I'm planting in in the cocoa plantation, <laughs> and it functions. Yeah. It's yeah. it's it's uh, I have a thousand and one hundred and something cocoa trees. And I have, uh, uh, for each cocoa tree, a uh, mother tree, that's uh, a tree upon, and I prune that mother tree every top, that mother tree every year, cut all the branches, uh, all the branchlets, and let it uh, on its skeleton without leaves in winter time. And 
uh, yeah, in winter time or late winter time, and then in uh, early spring time. Uh, this this year I did the same. The first time I plant uh, corn and, and beans and vegetables in between. But this later on. Coming back to to Europe, to our operation in uh, Europe. Now it was it was interrupted where I was. I franchise franchise. Yeah, uh, all our uh, cultivated plants, annuals, biennials, they in species succession in their occurrence in their uh, the place uh, uh, of their their place in species succession in our ecosystem is in the moment or at the moment when a forest or a big tree or a forest is breaking down, let's say it's uh, a small clearing or a, big, a smaller or a bigger, bigger clearing. Then you have a lot of franchise in the system and it's exactly the, the, the place where our uh, plants occur. It's there. It's their place. There are some ones which are also of a forest, wheat, uh, that is the cereals, but they are more of a savannic uh, system. If you look to the Mediterranean, it, uh, wheat is, orig is the origin of wheat is Turkey. Uh, origin of of uh, barley is Romania, Bulgaria, and then uh, Germany. Germany, uh, oh uh, no, not oats. Uh, uh, oats is Bulgaria, and Germany is is. Uh, uh, Bali, Bali, and, and, and Eastern Germany and, and Russia is uh, your uh, uh, Rai, is Rai, and so. But all they are all part of of a forest. As I say, they are of an open forest, and animals manage it, uh, and we, you can test it. It, it functions very well. You, can, you, it's, you don't. It's not necessary to plow. Uh, you can plant it. You can, you could. We can. We will. Perhaps one day. Uh, you plant a thousand or two thousand trees. Let them grow first. And if it, when you have a, a beautiful young forest, you plant fast-growing tree tools. To uh, think, consider that you will. It have easier if you plant it in straight rows or in straight in, in rows, civilized, in order to facilitate your, your work. So you can uh, your work or your intervention, then you can do it mecha mechanized. But if you have now once having that uh, forest, so you can plant in late winter cereals in late uh, autumn time. You will plant it in the before. July, topped forest. You cut the, the branches of all the all the, the, the weed trees, of all the uh, uh, elder tree, of all this uh, the ash trees, and, and so on, in order to get to get more on the skeleton. And at that time, which, if it is beginning July, you can you can plant uh, a late autumn uh, crop, as I said to you. Uh, Different, different one which I've described to you. It, it might be fodder for your for your animals, or it might be yellow turnip or something else, or oh, vegetables. And then in in uh, late autumn time, uh, organic matter you have a lot. You can plant your cereals into the field without any problem. We have machines nowadays to do that. And what we don't have, we have at least technology. It needs to, to uh, uh, construct machines. Uh, in any case, I believe that we have to rethink the machines we have. Tractor, as we use it, it's something, for me at least, it's something between stupid and ridiculous. We compacted our soil and we compacted every every year lo, uh, longer. When we introduced the tractors in the beginning of the fifties, last century, we used a small tractor. There is all, still a small one outside, uh, bigger than the smallest one we had. 
Then the soil was not yet uh, compacted, and then, then the soil got compacted due to the use of the new machines we had, and more bare soil. We cut the last, the, all the, the fruit trees in between, the hedges, they, they eliminated in the beginning of the 20s because they had to use, they had been taught that it's cheaper to use uh, nitrogen and uh, phosphorus from a factory, uh, which was a leftover a byproduct or a leftover product uh, or capacity to produce in the first, for the First World War. And then it had been brought to the agriculture. And so they, they, they were recommended, farmers were recommended and paid for to get rid of the, of the hedges, which were a, a substantial and important element to have fertility uh, in the soil. Uh, later on, I will come to that uh, aspect. So you're planting now, end of November, uh, end of October. The next springtime, cereals, end of March, might be this height. End of April, it's like this, or like this, or like this. And it will flower. And that it's, it, they will grow together with the trees. The trees, if you prune them, or let's say, uh, top them, uh, end, beginning July, they will make small branches, branches like 10, 15 centimeters, each, each one about three, four, five parts. And so next springtime, they nearly explode. And so they produce a lot of organic matter. Once again, a lot of leaves, a lot of, uh, a lot of growth. And the fact of having been topped, they, this induces that tree or those trees to send codified exudates, let's say assim assimilados, to the part of that part of their mycorrhism of bacteria, fungi, and other, other ones which live close to their rootlets, to produce growth hormone for them. And these growth, ho growth hormones for plant not being, plants not being egoists nor autists, they are all linked in the soil uh, by the mycorrhism, which they share together, let's say it's over the position of the mycorrhism. If you look in a microscope, you see that it's, it's a, each rootlet, each rootlet of the plant is accompanied, or yeah, it's, it has in surrounding at least one centimeter, three or more centimeters of a spongy. Um, uh, fluffy uh, <clears throat> mixture between uh, formed spongy fluffy mixture of uh, bacteria and fungi, which uh, is so called ectomycorrhism, which are the same, do the same thing as our, uh, as our bacteria in our uh, belly or in the mouth. Uh, let's just say they help, they in fact they do the job of make available uh, nutrients and uh, make available or produce certain substances plant needs. If a plant needs water, it goes to the fungi. The uh, fungi gives a little bit codified once again for that fungi, for a certain type of fungi. I need water. Okay, it gives a little bit of exudates, and then the fungi, oh, yeah, okay, I will get water. It can go two meters, three meters in order to get water, because the hyphen, say, of the fungi, they occupy, a bit, the biggest fungi, it can occupy three, four, five, six, or ten hectares. That is a big, big fields. But also the small, smaller ones we don't see, often we don't see from bare uh, eye, they go 20 centimeters, 30 centimeters in order to get water. And then I need some um, potassium, okay, uh, available. So uh, it's once again codified for the, uh, for the microorganism which is uh, able or equipped to do that, it will do it. It gives a little bit of exudates and then it will do it. Uh, it we should uh, study uh, mycorrhism, that's to say, live the, the life in the soil. And if we would study it and understand, we would come to the conclusion we would see the idiotic uh, idea we have to give 
so-called fertilizer to the plants. You ever imagined that if you had no life on the planet, the planet would be something a mixture between Venus and Mars. No life. Water would come back to the planet, a lot of wind, cold at now and night time, hot. Daytime, a lot of storm. Uh, since four and a half since three and a half to four billions of years we have life on the planet and life has created a condition uh, for more life uh, on the planet in each time more conditions. And only man, modern man, he came to the conclusion that, that he has to do. But uh, other ones do much more sm uh, much smarter, much more intelligent, less energy, and in a much better way. And so, nutrients. Uh, Hans-Peter Rusch, a scientist of the last century, microbiologist, he appointed in his research, he came to the conclusion that in a medium, uh, so-called fertile, loamy soil here in Central Europe, we have potassium for at least 80 million years to harvest every year four to six tons of cereals. It's quite a lot. 50, 60, 70 millions of years. The places will be different. That to say the planet will have uh, <clears throat> made a lot of of uh, modification that other has, has uh, suffered and suffered. He will uh, bring new minerals to the top, and so it's not necessary. The same thing as phosphorus. Phosphorus you have sufficient. There is no, no problem. I am working in the tropics on places where I had been set, told, and uh, you can read also in the, in the, in the, in the literature uh, scientific research is that the place I uh, bought, it's not adapted and not at all recommendable to plant cocoa because pH 3, 7 to 4 and only traces of uh, uh, phosphorus and nearly no potassium and aluminium and toxic uh, concentration. In a minute, 10 years later, after beginning, without the use of fertilizer, only using natural processes or employing natural processes, they blamed me that I bought the best land <laughs> of the whole region. And in the meantime, everybody is convinced that the gringo has the best soil. There's no better soil because his cocoa has no diseases, no pests, and produces a lot. And every day, it's, uh, every, every time, it's, it's, uh, or every year, it's more, uh, it's, it's more vigorous, produces more. And then, additionally, uh, it's raining <laughs> all the time, let us say, much more on the place of the gringo than on other places. And so they believe that I'm something like, uh, 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 how it's called, a, a male witch? <laughs> a warlock. A volo, yeah, the time volo. They are, conv they are convinced because it rains on my place and it doesn't rain, it's surrounding. Uh, and so uh, not, something is not, is not correct. Uh, and also they are convinced that, that planting so much it will produce nothing, but uh, we can't, as Schopenhauer said, uh, 150 years, 170 years ago, wrote in his uh, oeuvre, uh, let, me, let me translate it into English. I can't. One of his oeuvre, uh, he said that man only can understand what he learned, that it exists. And this is very true. Man can only under he sees 
that something is different, but he can't understand. And so it doesn't exist for him. That's to say, it, he, he can't, he, he can't, uh, uh, he's not able to, to say that. And this is our a great difficulty. And then there is another great difficulty, and this difficulty is semantic. That's to say, the language we use. It's uh, also in, in fairy tales, in religion, in all places we have, this is in all branches we have problems. That's to say, we, cre we have a long, long, long history of, uh, let's say, the formation of our species, of our way of looking at the world and interacting. As I said to you, in my interpretation, man, 12,000 years, years ago, he lost his, his uh, habitat. And he did not achieve, up to now, uh, to, to, to be useful, to figure out uh, a niche for, for him to be useful, to be serviceable to life. And this, uh, is, I believe, this would be, or this would be the, it's the only way that we can survive. Because if we look at different places, thousands of civilizations appeared. Many, many, many we know in the history of history, but prehistoric, we only see some rests of civilization. And they disappeared, all of them, for the same reason. Conflict with the ecosystem. After the, the end of the last icy period, 88% of the places he lived turned into forest, into forest. And removing that ecosystem is lethal. We do it. We did it. And in the mean first he did it locally, then collapse. Destroying ecosystem, depleting resources. No more fertilizer, let's just say, no more fertile soil. Uh, lack of water, and so on. And then, parallel to this, uh, beginning to, be, to, to get scarce resources, war. Well, you, you, we are living here in Europe since a long time, and now they are doing the new, new experiment. Despite of the fact that one of the wise men of our yeah, newer time or recent uh, yeah, newer time, it was Mahatma Gandhi. He said that the only way to come to peace is a peace by itself. Is peace by itself. There is no other possibility. Producing arms and sent to Ukraine it doesn't, it doesn't give its, it, its right. We have now two wars. Uh, <clears throat> in Europe, from Europe, and now the last, next war, we knew this, we learned this, will be for Europe, and they do it. They do it. It's tragic, tragedy. But go back now to our agriculture, once again. And so, uh, this, I was with a franchise, it, with uh, plants growing. If I would, once again, if I would uh, be asked to create a system here, I would do it in a similar way, because I, I came, I went to, to the tropics, uh, having done or ex tested exactly what I showed you here now. It's not, show it here. It's now in the tropics, but it's the same thing, but only a little bit more extreme even. Uh, every year, uh, I were, I'm a cocoa farmer, yeah, since more than 40 years. Uh, no, no, you have, you need, we need a sound. And it begin once again. <laughs> and the microphone and computer. We'll try. No, it's here. Just a moment. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think here. Just a moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we'll start from. Uh, so fruit, vegetables, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, begin once again. <laughs> Well, I have to say, yeah, afterwards I will explain it. So, here we go. I hope. Yeah, it's Perhaps. Perhaps. Uh, I have more or less a thousand one hundred and something uh, cocoa tree per hectare. And each cocoa tree has its mother tree. That's a tree upon it. And those trees I top. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have, a, thank you. <laughs> I have about 100, uh, 1,100 and uh, something cocoa tree per hectare. It's cocoa tree is more or less the size of a plum tree. And then each of those cocoa trees has a mother tree upon it. Tree a little bit higher, and I top that mother tree every year. Cut all the, the branches, let perhaps 2% or nothing of the, the leaves. This I do after harvest, after, after my main harvest of the cocoa in uh, late autumn. And Why doesn't it function now? Okay, now. Here we go. 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 Here we it's recovering and the compensation may be uh, more cocoa. And at the same time, uh, there are plant beans, vegetables, and then one cocoa tree which suffered from the impact of the tree. It's a cup of here. And we will graft it. Uh, next week we will graft it. And so in two years it will produce Uh, a cocoa plantation is the same thing or similar to an apple operation or an apple plantation or plum plantation. We could have, in fact, it's the same thing. It's similar, very, very similar to, to plum. Plum is a medium layer tree and it would need some somebody up or somebody a tree upon it and that tree you should uh, top every year this had been done in in former time here in europe and uh, apple tree they are medium high and they should have in between some emergent tree tools we used in former time often the uh, black poplar and then they had been uh, topped not only top pruned letting only the cylinder with uh, uh, stumps of the, of the branches uh, every year. This uh, resulted in high productivity of the apple. Uh, trees, they lived 200 years, 250 years. I was grow I grew up in a place where we had a lot of, of apple trees and, and pear trees still, uh, as popularly they said, it came from the before the Landsknecht site. That's to say, before the, the, the Re French Revolution. And then 
In the beginning of the 50s, they had been felt, paid by a state, subsidies. No, nearly forced to, to, to cut them. And then we counted really the, the, the rings they had, and there were many, many pear trees and apple trees, which really had 250, 270 rings. That is a very, very old trees, and they produced a lot. We had pear trees, which every year gave 500 kilos, 600 kilos of fruit. And uh, I was 13 years when I got the first time in my life sugar. <laughs> we didn't use sugar. We used the concentrate made out of, of uh, pear juice. Uh, it's still you can buy it in Switzerland. It's called uh, Birnell. It's not more common, but you can buy it still. Uh, it tastes like honey, and it was it was a good sweetener. Let's say I, I loved it. Uh, that sweetener and pears we had, yeah, we had a lot. Uh, and overall, pear trees which flowered very very late, normally at the time when when uh, the wheat or um, rye or spelt was flowering. That is winter. Cereals were flowering, so it was uh, exactly the synchronized the yearly metabolism of the trees together with the those cereals. Okay, back now to this operation. This operation I said to you, I make every I top all these trees. It's an operation which costs to me. I have to do it by hand. By hand, not I have a small chainsaw. Uh, and so I spent about 12 to 15 days a year in order to prune all these trees and, and chop out, up the material, which by each side results in, we did now this year the third time, an, uh, an investigation which results in about 150 to 200,000 kilo of green matter per hectare, which corresponds to about 18 to 20,000 kilo dry matter, which is four to five fold more than a forest would recycle. A strong forest uh, would recycle uh, under the, on the same place, the same site. Additionally, I have still nearly the same amount what a, 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 a a strong forest, a vigorous forest, natural forest was recycled. I get still from the uh, cocoa, that is the leaves of the cocoa, uh, branches of the cocoa, uh, which we have to, I have to prune six times a year, because six times I have a new flush of the cocoa, and so I have to uh, get off uh, excessive growth, like uh, uh, water shoots and, and other parts, and often they they cross one or another, they, they don't prune. And in any case, if you do that pruning, this uh, stimulates the tree to do more vigorous growth. And then you have the, the leaf fall of the mother trees. And upon all these cocoa, underneath still some vegetation on the ground, uh, and then cocoa tree, second layer, and then the, the mother trees, third layer, fourth layer, about 10 to 15 uh, huge trees. Those I don't prune, but uh, I prefer those trees which uh, remain without leaves. That's to say deciduous trees which remain re without leaves in winter time. So in winter time, at uh, the moment of pruning of those cocoa, is, uh, cocoa trees, it's all open, so I can plant vegetables and corn and beans uh, in between small patches of the cocoa plantation. Uh, it's not an operation to produce thousands of ton, but it's sufficient for me, and uh, let's say not only for me, for me, for my neighbors, for friends, and whatever we want. Uh, it's a byproduct, a by-effect of the pr uh, production of cocoa of high quality, and as one of the biggest or oh, great by-effect I have, I have an increase of at least half, cent half a centimeter to three centimeters of black soil every year. The pH, when I began, it was three, seven to four. Now it is five, seven to six, two, which is 
optimum for uh, hum humid tropics, it should not be higher. Uh, then you have the optimum uh, pH. And we have the black soil now upon and underneath, which was a yellow, pale yellow soil, soil uh, it's now brown. That's to say it, it turned, uh, it's enriched very much uh, in terms of organic matter. And if you believe or don't believe, but you have earthworms which weigh up to 300 grams. <laughs> they, are like, they are like snakes. <laughs> if you see them the first time, you're sure, you, 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 you believe to be sure that it's, it's a snake. It went, when, uh, when uh, uh, how it's called, when, when it, in cold, it's, it's, it's about uh, 40, 60, 70 centimeters, and they thick. And when it's extended, it's up to 152 meters. It's a big animal. And it's an animal which, uh, which works vertically. That's to say, it goes down. And so the soil, every year, it's being deeper. That's to say, it's going downwards. And so this makes that the system is each time more resistant for droughts and for other problems, and much more, uh, every year, more available uh, minerals. We could do, it doesn't grow so fast here in Denmark, but we could do the same thing, because uh, I tested it in Switzerland before I went to the tropics, it functions. Uh, it was exactly what the conclusion what, to what I came. I said to you, first I tested crop rotation. Uh, second, I tested combination, or let's say consortiums, consortia between different species. One of the species, this was uh, inspired of after a visit in, in uh, Latin America, corn and beans. If you plant corn and beans, two varieties which combine together, then if you have luck, you can plant both together. Normally beans grow faster, and so you plant beans a little bit later. When the corn has four leaves, you can plant beans, climbing beans. This uh, results that your corn uh, grows faster, uh, is more resistant to drought, and produces more or less 30% more. Much higher, too. And then you have, additionally, you have still uh, the beans, uh, might be between 1,000 to 2,000 kilo of dry beans. This, if you don't eat it, cattle will eat it too. And so uh, we would have corn and beans. And if you do that, you don't need any fertilizer, any pesticides. It's uh, the, the beans, uh, once climbing up, uh, you have to do, or you have to, to make sure that it doesn't uh, that it isn't taller at the moment when it's flowering, and it's not yet, uh, how it's called, closed or, or tightened. The, the place where the, 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 the um, how it's called, the cups of the, the tree, uh, of, the, of the corn comes out, because then a car, uh, uh, the, the corn will not be able to, to, be, to be pollinized. But if you uh, look or yeah, uh, attain or achieve to get a, a good combination, which would not be very difficult to, to figure out, it's a question of tests, then the, the success is complete. Then in autumn time, the whole ground is covered with uh, feces of earthworms, one, two, three centimeters. And if you then, end of October, mid-October, harvesting the corn, would broadcast before or simultaneously to the harvest, uh, wheat, you could, you could harvest the, cor the corn about 20 centimeters, 30 centimeters upon the soil, and then shred on the rest, and so the wheat would be, the seeds of the wheat would be covered uh, together with some leaves, which, which fall down and of, the, of the corn and of the beans, the uh, rest of the beans. And then you need, once again, no fertilizer, nothing. And if you would now, or then, in, uh, once again, two or three varieties of 
wheat, long straw wheat, one 160, 170, the other one 180, 190, and so two meters or two meters 20. The biggest portion of it, uh, proportion of the lower one, 160, 170. And then if you would plant, or if you do, I tested it, uh, plant in March, still uh, peace, a long straw piece, uh, into the field, uh, it will grow and it will produce an extra and your wheat will produce more. And so you have two crops once again and much more straw. Let's say all tested. I, I did it in, in, uh, in the mid 70s and it, I suppose, is not uh, more different, not much different. 1976, seven, 1977, we had a summertime similar to what you had, I believe, this year, what it was dry? Yeah, this, this year it was dry. It didn't rain from mid-May until end July. No rain. Same thing as this year. This is not, uh, not out, not, not uh, uh, how it's called, a catastrophe. Uh, I divided my field. I, had, I hired a piece of land in order to test. This, um, the different combinations or consortia, consortia in the field. And so, uh, and I used the hybrids, the usual hybrids and recommended hybrids uh, we had in, in that place and looking also for the neighboring ones. And the, uh, the neighboring fields, end of July, corn was this height. And so they decided to cut it because it was not able to produce it. Begin to paint, began to flowering, but mm, small cups. It's not. It it makes no sense. And my uh, uh, my corn, together with uh, with um, the beans, uh, the, uh, the the per definition of the uh, of the institute who, who uh, raised it or created it, uh, two meter twenty more or less height. It was two meter fifty, and the beans. No problems of drought, and I divided the field in four different plots. Two uh, in in uh, opposite place in terms of of di diagonal, without beans, and the other one, the other one with, be with beans, and it, the, the the two ones without beans, they were like this. And the other ones, they are like that. And so it was not lack of auto. It was a lack of intelligence. And so we could do quite a lot of, of uh, things and improve a little bit. But still, as I said to you, uh, for really regenerative, regenerative agriculture, I came to the conclusion that we have to create agroforest or agroecosystems similar in their way of functioning, in their organization and stratification to the natural and original ecosystem. Here we would have a forest, 30 meters tall, and uh, we can make agriculture, we can raise cattle, we can produce um, whatever we want, let's say, our cereals, without any problem. Only we have to uh, prune, we have to, we have to learn to top trees and to prune trees. And when I did it in Brazil, it was now uh, the first time mechanized. It was 15, 2015. Then I had a visit, I, I, I got constructed, because due to lack of, of uh, adequate machinery still, I constructed a, a, a tower on a tractor, which is not difficult, a tower, and so I was on the tower on the platform, and uh, I had a tractor driver underneath, and so I cut one a eucalyptus tree after the other. Uh, one hectare, uh, we spent about six hours 
to, to cut, we had in that field 2,222. That is a every one and a half to three meters, that is a one and a half meter from one to the other in a row, and every three meter one row. We had an eucalyptus tree and I cut all of them. Uh, they were about eight to 12 meters tall and so on, and I cut them five and a half meters tall. Before we did that, about two months earlier, I cut all of the branches to come to five meters, and so we had only half a meter with some branches, and I cut them a little bit too, in order to shorten it a little bit. So it was open, and the organic matter, we shredded. And this gave, in that case, it gave five centimeters of shredded material. I planted different things, corn, beans, soya beans, uh, vegetables. It was impressive. Simply impressive what you harvest in this case. And when we harvested the, the, the corn and soya beans, uh, three, four months later, it was a forest. And we decided to prune it once again and plant the second, uh, second, uh, that is a second, second crop. This you can't do in Europe. <laughs> you have not sufficient sunshine. But once a year, we, uh, purple tree, uh, they, they do it, and willow tree too, we can do it. And we can plant also a lot of trees, and then we, can, we could top them. And then I had a visit of the owner of the biggest sawmill in uh, Brazil. He came, uh, yeah, he came to visit me, he, he saw in, 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 the, in the newspaper that I'm doing this, uh, 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 how it's called, a uh, little bit not common uh, type of, of agriculture and planting a lot of trees. So he asked me to, to, to allow him to visit me. And when he came, he was excited, earnest. If we could do it all over the world, this would be the biggest uh, present for all owners of sawmills because these results in a straight stem, cylindric, tensile wood, a dense wood, it doesn't bend and doesn't split. Straight wood, cylindric, it, it doesn't bend when you saw it and it doesn't split. It's a dream of all owners of sawmill. And so in this case, wood would be a byproduct, a by effect of doing agriculture. And then you have a lot of organic metal on the soil. And we would, in this case, create soil. That's to say, we would get soil and after the end of our life, we could pass our land to, our, to the next generation, happy and proud that we did a good job, that we were serviceable to life and useful, uh, yeah, and useful for the planet. And this, uh, I, for me, believe, could be one of the niches for modern man. Think about. Uh, yeah, think about the significance of, in the meantime, 200,000 years that man turned to be the dominant big animal on the planet. Let's say the most do dominant animal on the planet. And if you look at history of the planet, life for me is one of the tools, part of the instrumentarium, which the planet created for itself to realize its strategy of being. And we are not, we cannot be owner of this planet. We are part of a macroorganism. And part of a macroorganism, if that part, or if parts of a macroorganism decide or act in a non-harmonious way, 
to the into the macroism, macroorganism, that's to say, uh, compartment of of uh, autists, autists or egoists, it turns into a council, and this induces at the same time modification in that macroorganism, which results that the presence, the future presence of that species becomes to be non-wanted, no more wanted. And this happened to modern man in the last 12,000 years many, many, many times. About 3,000 years ago, study history, all civilization on the whole world disappeared. We don't know why, but they disappeared. And the civilization which came up afterwards, one after the other, disappeared. The last big one here in Europe which disappeared was Rome. First, the western part of Roman of, uh, ancient old Roman Empire. Uh, it disappeared 500 and something, 550 years after Christ. And they say that it was the Vandalos, the Vandals, who destroyed that Rome and the, and the Italian peninsula. But it was not the Vandals. It was Rome itself. It rotted, and the Vandals, they only passed in, 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 in the, that's to say, in that part of the uh, Roman Empire, and city after city, they, uh, how it's called, stopped the transit on the uh, excellent road, uh, or the uh, road system Romans had, and cut the water supply for the cities, which was easy, agroconducto, the water conducts, they had, the Romans, they were better than our system, because they brought fresh water uh, in curled, uh, curled way to, to the city, which when it came to the city it was cooled down and clean. But they cut it off. And so after, if I remember correct, it was about 30 days, 300 inhabitants left over in Rome, not killed by the Vandals. Romans killed them themselves. Yeah, then afterwards, some thousand years later, uh, thousand one hundred years later, two hundred years later, the Pope, uh, it was, mm, I don't remember, I would remember, think later, but it's not, not important. He went to England and he visited England and then he came to a church and that is one of the churches and there they distributed a black, uh, black stones to the, to the inhabitants and everybody was happy. And then he asked the, uh, the, the priest, what do you do? Why, why do people are happy receiving these black stones? And then he, uh, ex the, the, the priest explained that it's coal to heat the house. You need stones. You use stones. We use uh, wood because at that time it Italy was one big forest <laughs> once again. And so this will happen when, or this happens when uh, uh, civilization wiped out, wiped out. Uh, afterwards, nature comes back. The same thing. Yeah, I will stop. <laughs> uh, the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The same thing as in uh, Chernobyl. You ever have heard of the development in the meantime of the ecosystem in, in Chernobyl? Yeah, Chernobyl has now in the meantime, 30 years after the explosion of the uh, power plant, atomic power plant, has this, a much stronger, a very vigorous vegetation on a place not adapted for, uh, for, for man, for the presence of man, a lot of radiation. But uh, there are some, they figure out that they are living a lot of animals and a lot of vegetation, strong vegetation, vigorous vegetation all over the place. And they figured out about eight years ago that there appeared some exotics uh, called, uh, that is a bacteria, which make radiosynthesis. That is to say they use radioactivity in order to 
get rid of, they eat it and make uh, store energy, that energy, in the form of, of um, uh, carbohydrates in their, in their body. Yeah. Exotics. Only a small uh, remark for uh, yeah, notation for exotics. For me, there are no exotic species, no invasive species. I did it, I told it in the beginning. There are species which come or which appear and they spread because they have something to do. They are not coming to steal, not coming to do to, 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 to something bad. They come in order to resolve. And so if I have distals, it's not an invasive species, it's not a nasty species. It's, an, it's a sign that the soil is uh, compacted. And if you have some trees or some, some, something else, uh, Ailantus altissima, forbidden to, to, speak the, to, to say the name and to plant them more even, you go to, 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 to jail. If you do it in the European community, it appears because you have destroyed the ecosystem. And it's the most efficient, they are the most efficient one. And we could try to figure out what they are doing and why they are doing it, and then employ them. This had been written some 2,700 years ago in Babylonia. Uh, there was written, transform your enemy in your right hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah question, you will say. So we'll just take uh, questions and yeah, okay. go ahead. You have to answer them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah this is a lot, but you are, you are the organizer. And you are the organizer and have to say what, what is coming now. Maybe you can go the proceeding of... Oh, yeah, yeah the microphone for, the, for people. Hello? Hello? People need to come up and ask yeah. questions. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Uh, my question is about the Alan Savory method and what your opinion on his approach to regenerative farming is. Uh, I admire Alan Savory. You have to see the place of origin of him. He comes from uh, uh, Zimbabwe. He comes from Zimbabwe. He was an, an Englishman who comes from Zimbabwe. He was born in Zimbabwe. I uh, visited Zimbabwe uh, and I worked a, a small time there in 1965, 19, 1965, 1967. And Zimbabwe at that time, it was a paradise, more or less a paradise. It was a typical savanna. Uh, English, it, it had been transformed by English people, but they raised a lot of animals, uh, it had a certain conservative cultivation of some uh, cereals, but more uh, animals. And there was, in many, many, you know, it was common in some, in some way, the, a mix of, of wild animals, of elephants and, and whatever you want, of, of lions and other things, uh, together with cattle of those people. I saw it days later on, I worked more than one year in, uh, uh, afterwards in Namibia. It was the same thing, the sub-desert, sub which we which I say that it's sub-desert, but it was, uh, it was a savanna too. It was not a, a, a desert, it's nowadays a desert. It turned into the desert. So, Alan Savory. Alan Savory, his uh, hypothesis is, and it's not, uh, not, uh, not at all, uh, that no, it's a very, it's very good. That if we made would make a management of our ecosystem, of that type of our ecosystems, not of all ecosystems, with with animals. There are, uh, we had, in in fact, in in former time, my father, for example, he had his his cows only three to four hours on one place. Only three to four hours. And then what they didn't cut, they eat, they, they cut, and next day they went to, that's the next, afterwards they went to the next, the next place. And this results that the vegetation uh, might improve. But 
Now comes the next one. If you have a desert, as we did it now, or have it now, you look here in Denmark, it's the same thing. It's not necessary to go far. No more trees. And so how I can now establish those trees once again, it's not the same as you see often in, in those uh, dry or semi-dry areas, northeast of Brazil, the trees are still present, as long as we don't use uh, plough and don't use glyphosate. That, uh, uh, we have still a big a pressure from a part of the trees. Then, if you do there, uh, an intelligent management is cut forward. But if you would do it here in Europe, or in other places, Brazil too, where they have, in the meantime, 10,000 hectares without any tree, you can't recover that uh, that place or make or get it back to forest or to a functioning savanna with cattle present because they will eat the seedlings. And so you have to establish first those trees. And so uh, I had a quarrel with, with one of the guys which was together with me in the place of Josipa, coming with his uh, management, holistic management. Yeah, yeah, it's all okay. Holistic management which without, any, without any trees, it's not possible. It should be a forest. That's to say we first would have to, to re-establish our forest and then see also species succession. Uh, if you enter uh, from that degraded places, compacted soil, uh, some poor grasses, some poor herbs, uh, cattle will not plant those trees. If you could give them seeds, but then you had to have to take them out because if you return after two months or one, one month, they eat, they eat latest. Five months later, ten months later, when the trees are like this, they prefer to eat those, that new apple tree and that new pear, pear tree. That doesn't function. Also, the, all other tree, it, 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 is, uh, it might be a, a, an ash tree or, or a, a poplar tree, cattle eat all. Once having established our forest, then we can return with, with cattle. And we, have, we should have to help them a little bit topping, because uh, this was the case for in Europe. We did it. That is to say, our, our ancestors, at least in Switzerland and in northern Italy, which I knew, they did it. We had a lot of property, which was not pruned by cattle. It had been pruned by men. And then we had a lot of ash trees. They are partly uh, cattle did it because the, the hedges had been maintained this side or this side. So cattle pruned it, but uh, that is they had possibility to prune it. Uh, then hazelnut too, it could be, but then you have no hazelnut. And so we, we have to, uh, we should make some intervention, uh, that is to say consider some intervention. But in any case, first we should plant uh, a system which, uh, that is to say, which those animals afterwards can mention. Then we can come to Alan Savory. Hello, Ernest, and thank you very much for all your inspiration. I have two questions for you. One is, how small a scale can, this be, can your principles be done? Are we talking maybe 80 square meters? Or, and the other question is, uh, how do you place all the biomass, the mulch that you get from the trees when you prune them? Is there a special way to place it? Thank you. Uh, the last question first. I put all organic matter in counterline, organize it in counterline. This has two reasons. One reason is to help to retain water, and the other reason is something very practical. In order to uh, be easier, uh, yeah, to get it reasonable to, to transit in the place, because I have to harvest uh, my cocoa, I have to prune uh, my cocoa, and so in order to facilitate that, I organize it in counterline. And I distribute it uh, on the whole field. Uh, this is one. And then this, the second one. Uh, I did agriculture even, this is called urban gardening. 
Even when I was in Berlin, two years, or then in Cambridge, or in Zurich, I lived eight years in Zurich, yeah, my life, uh, middle of the, of the city, four years and then four years, and, and that's the same in a, in a sub-urban area, but also a lot of houses. And my strategy to make agriculture was, were two. Once I did, I made vertical and horizontal agriculture in my house. Uh, from the beginning on, I began to, to plant. In February, you planted tomatoes in, in, your, in your living room and uh, close to the, to the window. And then, then you have some, some herbs too to plant. And then when the springtime comes, you bring it outside. And then perhaps you have a terrace, you, you plant them too, and then you uh, some some uh, you 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 uh, guide the tomatoes uh, downwards and the, the the beans upwards, so your your neighbor will uh, uh, will have a present too. That he will he can harvest some tomatoes you have planted and beans he will plant too. The upper neighbor will have beans and the upper neighbor will have. Tomatoes and then a lot of herbs and then I uh, make made a, lot, a big box and brought some some rainworms uh, earthworms too to the place and we made compost and so we had uh, and then I began also on the roof I had a lot of quarrel with uh, with the administration of the house but in Zurich as well as in Berlin not in England there I had like I had a, a, I got a premium. It was a special, let us say, it was a man, uh, the owner of the place, who was very, very happy that he first time in his life saw that uh, he in his lawn, in his garden, in his own house, uh, can harvest all vegetables in the best in best quality, and they are beautiful. They are, uh, they, let's say, they can be extremely beautiful too. And so I mixed them together with his uh, ornamental plants, and then we could, you can, graft the trees in the city. Yeah? There are many beech trees, and you will uh, uh, graft some uh, other, let's say, uh, material of beech tree with peak uh, nuts. A beech tree has normally very small seeds. There are some ones which, which give big uh, nuts, bigger nuts. And then uh, oak. Oak is one of the, well, it was staple food in former time all over the northern continent. In America as well as Europe and in Asia too. And we still, when I was a small boy, there was a, <laughs> a name for uh, poor people that it is an Eichelfresser. That's to say, in a, a person who has to eat uh, oak, uh, that's to say, yeah, the, the, how it's called, the uh, acorns. The acorns. And I ate as a child not forced, interest. Uh, it was my hobby. Uh, from three, four, four years, I, I still remember, began to eat them. There are oak, uh, there are acorns which are sweet and big ones. And so I began to, to test them, all of them, so I knew the best ones. Also beach, there were some ones who were tiny and they're not very good, and the other ones are bigger. So we could choose for them. And then you, you, you prune all, uh, you, 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 uh, uh, you could, we could, you can do it in the city. It's not forbidden yet to uh, to uh, graft all these oak and beech trees which are in the region. Go to the forest and uh, graft them too. You can climb the, the stem and then you graft them to have big, big ones. If you uh, use them, this is big ones. There are bitter ones and less bitter ones are sweet ones. Uh, bitter ones can be good too. If you are good, uh, that's safe. If you are big, and uh, if you put it in water, in cold water, and change water about one month, during one month, every day change, so they lo lose their bitterness and they lose their astringency. And then you can peel them and chop them up, uh, grind them, and then you make a silo out of it, that's a sauerkraut, out of it, it, and it tastes like fresh cheese. It's a marvelous food. It's a marvelous food. I wouldn't uh, starve if there would be no supermarket, no more, nothing more to, to, to buy. 
uh, you can do agriculture if you have land or not land. You can do it. And then you, 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 it's not forbidden yet to plant some, some climbers uh, to the trees in the cities. And um, then it's, it's sometimes you begin to plant in a very tiny spot in the, in the park. You plant some, some uh, radish and some, some rucola. You make a compost out of organic matter. Uh, good compost. We, can, we could uh, teach how to do it yourself. You need nothing. You need a box. Uh, for the household, it's like this, a box like, the box like this, and then they make an inner box, uh, more or less this distance from the outer box, with some uh, small holes, and put your, all the material you have in the house, toilet paper, the uh, rest of vegetables, uh, leaves, you, uh, something which they are cleaning in front of the house, put all in, in that. And then... This turns into an excellent compost. You have three, four boxes of this. This turns into an excellent compost. And that's compost you can use afterwards in order to make vertical uh, agriculture or to plant in the park. Uh, that is in public places you plant rucola. And then they will, yeah, you will have a, a small quarrel. But insist, because it's not yet forbidden, yeah? You can plant it, and you can do it. It needs only this small spot of that lawn. You have to, to, to loosen and uh, get off the, the, the grass a little bit, and then plant some seeds of rucola and put, put the, 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 the rest of the roots, uh, that's not the roots of the, of, the, uh, of the grass upon, without earth, and so they will grow. Afterwards, it will, you will enrich a little bit your, uh, your place. 80 meters square, is, which would be luxury. You, 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 you remember, perhaps, it, it, it existed here in, in Denmark, uh, sure, they do. In the uh, 19th century, a German guy uh, called Schreber, he recommended, and it had been done during the time of Bismarck, to give to people in the city uh, 100 meters square, of land to to produce produce our vegetables, I in Zurich, despite of the fact it was not fashion that the young man would have uh, this one of the meter square, but I hired a, a small place, it's, uh, one of those um, uh, one hundred. Let's just say yeah, one hundred me, me, uh, meter square cells, and I cultivated. Oh, I need for me, my, for, for my friends and for what, whatever you want, a lot of berries, a lot of, of uh, vegetables. And I had uh, sufficient vegetables, potatoes, and oh, whatever, whatever you want. not in cereals, but the rest, potatoes, um, vegetables, berries, I had sufficient for the whole year. Only out of those 100 uh, meters square. And I had a lot of apple, a lot of cherry, a lot of, of uh, pears. So, uh, you can do a lot of things, and I would. This could be one of the uh, of the measures we could take in order to uh, incentivate people. Uh, this is the best life life insurance. That is, what would be one of the life insurance we could do in order to avoid problems in, 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 play, in, in times of crisis, and it would be part of, of agro-yoga and agro-fitness. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it would be much more intelligent, and it would cost less the planet than our academies we have in the cities offering uh, yoga and, yoking fit and, and offering fitness. That fitness is, is very cheap and it, uh, very, it's expensive in money, but it doesn't give an effect uh, you would have. And if you did it, uh, planting your vegetables, your berries, your apples, and your potatoes, it could give more pleasure. Hello. Uh, so one of the things that your farm in uh, Brazil is known for is to bring the rain back to the area. So my question is, how many hectares of uh, centropic food forest do you estimate it will take to create a change at the microclimatic uh, scale? Yeah, I can uh, give you an answer on this. Upon this, 
for once, for one way, I, for one side, I don't use the word syntropic uh, agriculture. I created the word. Uh, when in 16, 2016, I had a visit of two very worldwide famous scientists. And I showed them a place where I'm working. It was exactly that uh, example where I uh, topped eucalyptus planting other things in PD. And it was dry season, peak of dry season, and the place, and that place, uh, four or five months, normally four and a half months, without any gut of rains and temperature during daytime between 25 and 35 degrees. And nighttime, at nighttime, 15 to 16 degrees, a lot of wind, dry season, all, all dry. And I planted uh, in order to provoca for provocation, I planted exotics, on the exotics, really for provocation. I would plant here. Uh, this Islandus altissima too, in order to, to show that. No, no, I would prune uh, uh, in order to avoid that I plant, that I can say that I planted it. I would look for a place with Islandus altissima, would top them and, and prune them and plant vegetables in between in order to show that Islandus altissima is, is very useful and could, could, be, could do a very good job. There still are some sp spots, at least in, in Germany, a lot of uh, Islandus altissima close to the high road, to the highway, and there are other places, abandoned places. Okay. Uh, uh, in terms of area, to be uh, ah, finishing the or finishing yeah, completing uh, syntropic agriculture or syntropic agroforests. Uh, then I had a place with. Bananas and eucalyptus upon 2,000 eucalyptus per hectare and bananas uh, underneath. Every uh, one meter, three meter and, and a half a row, and every one forty more or less uh, an eucalyptus tree, and every second eucalyptus tree in that row uh, banana, and then grass in between, and the grass cut four, five times, six times a year, and organized in a double row to the eucalyptus banana. And just in the in a, a peak of the dry season, that visit, the bananas began to flower. They were very, very strong, without any uh, sign of water stress. And close by, on the same field, I had a plot in order to show the difference, only bananas and the grass, and then the grass too. Let's say I brought only grass. The grass was brown because it was dry. But the grass underneath the eucalyptus was green, dark green, growing. And the grass only, and bananas in between. Uh, bananas, 80% had died in the meantime, planted at the same time as the other one, which were flowering, flowering and beautiful. They died and merged, they, 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 they faded away, 80%. Uh, the other ones were very, very small. Not at all at the point to, to flower, not more than, uh, at the point to disappear uh, uh, for once at all. And uh, once at all. And then I said to those two scientists, if or one day, when you come to the point that we are will be able to produce what we need for our day-to-day, -day, in order to satisfy our day-to-day -day metabolism, in a way, so that we get a positive energetic balance, and also a positive balance in terms of quantity and quality of service of established life. Uh, on the place, once again, and also considering the who Macroorganism, macro planet Earth. That's to say, not stealing of one place and bring to the other place. No, on the same place. Then we could say that we would have, or we will have, a syntropic agriculture. But nowadays, there are thousands of people all over the world selling recipes for syntropic agriculture 
I, I believe they not even know what is syntropy. Syntropy is, in fact, is a term coming from ancient Greek, from ancient Greek, the same as entropy. Entropy used to describe, or the, let's say, for the for processes, the quality of processes which go from more complex form to less complex form, releasing energy to the universe. And syntropy, in the same language, ancient Greek, used to, uh, for processes going from simple uh, forms to more complex forms, uh, complexifying or grasping energy from outside, from, yeah, from outside, and complexifying it and storing it in form of, uh, yeah, in more complex forms. This, for example, photosynthesis is one of these processes. But uh, two weeks after the small film Life in Syntropy, perhaps you have seen it once, had been uh, sent to the, to the universe, uh, dozens of people in Brazil first, and then hundreds of people all over the world began to offer workshops and consultancy in syntropic agriculture. And one of the guys, he offered a workshop for the production of syntropic beer. <laughs> and so, it, I, I, modestly, I'm doing farming, yeah, try to do, to do a mod yeah, modestly farming. Uh, we have, it, there is something, that's just a typical, um, feature of our modern society are waves of fashions. This is a fashion, and then everyone is uh, big mouth uh, selling recipes for syntropic agriculture, for uh, uh, holistic farming, for sustainable. And the most sustainable uh, enterprise in the world, you know, is bio, without doubt. You, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's more sustainable. You read the, the propaganda. Sorry? Yeah, it's convincing, the propaganda they make. And so it's the same thing of all these syntropics who sell their recipe. And can you answer his question about how big the area has to be for there to Yeah, to this come? I will uh, answer to you. It's, uh, it's about, it, according to the place, in a place like Denmark, it would be sufficient having 200 to 300 hectares because you are close to the sea, it's all close to the sea, and you have still a more or less intact ecosystem. It's not intact, but it's, it's much closer to, in, to be intact than if you go to, to the Sahara, it's, it's more difficult. If you were in the Sahara, you need at least two to three thousand hectares, and if it were in, it, uh, in a, it, let's say, transformed, planted, uh, in a way, uh, not irrigating, not no, with using no natural uh, strategies and processes, uh, and if you were able to do that, then having two to three thousand hectares green, evergreen, all over the year without any irrigation, then you would. Uh, have the possibility to, to bring back rain. But in those places, you would have to begin close to the sea, or at least on the bottom of a big, long body, uh, in the direction of, of the main direction of a wind. Then it will function easier. If you do, if you do it on the, on the, on the that's to say, scattered uh, in different places, it will not function. In our situation, I had the privilege to buy uh, 500 hectares, uh, 150 hectares, and it, the place is, uh, let's say, it's it's a place with 17 small creeks, uh, origin of, of the place, and they flow together, go to the sea, in, exactly in the direction of the main wind. This is in uh, southern hemisphere, south uh, east. And so I bought it exactly for that uh, reason. And I had 350 hectares without forest, uh, some grasses, ferns, and some small bush trees. And I reforested that 
uh, without the use of fertilizer, without uh, use of, of uh, also use of without the use of lime, despite of the fact that the pH was between three seven to four two four, four the base place is four five, and ten years later, uh, it was completely different. Uh, it was it we had our the rain of our own, and but I have another privilege still. Uh, not only this 350 hectares plus 150 hectares which are on the, on the farm, uh, two neighbors, they asked me to look at that UK for care for, for about a, a 700 hectares of them connected with our ones. And so this gives a, a great dynamic. As I said, so you have the influence, a strong influence on. Uh, the climate on the place, but if you plant now another, uh, if you plant even in the desert, uh, a small spot might be 500, 600 square meter of plants adapted to that climate. You will cool down the place, and you will create the pos the the, the, um, the um, conditions for other more demanding plants to come up. But this will not yet climb. Uh, change the climate of the of the region. It will only change if this, the place. Let's say we, you will have the rain of your own from a moment or not. That uh, the dynamic is sufficient to to create something like a pump. Let's say uh, to to lower the pressure of the, the yeah, of, of uh, low pressure, and then sucking the, uh, the the air from other places. Yeah, and if you can do it from the from the sea, then it's better even. That was the last question, so thank you very much, Hans. Yeah, thank you very much. And I'm glad or I'm happy. Uh, for your attention, and I thank you that you didn't uh, kill me for some <laughs> some uh, something like rude uh, annotations I made for. <laughs> <laughs>